بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد so continuing from where we left off last week, we had mentioned now so far two of the conditions of the conditions of La ilaha illallah. The first of those was Al-ilm, knowledge regarding the shahada in terms of the negation and the affirmation. The second condition that we mentioned last week, al yaqeen certainty. And an evidence from the Qur'an for that condition. Which is what? So, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا That indeed the believers are those who have Iman in Allah and His Messenger, then they do not doubt. They do not have any hesitation or doubt thereafter. That was from the actual text of the book. So now then after that, we move on to the third condition this week. And that is the condition of Al-Ikhlas Al-Munafi Lil-Shirk. Sincerity which opposes and negates and nullifies Shirk, sincerity, and the opposite of sincerity is shirk. A person who is not upon sincerity of worship to Allah, then it would mean that this person is upon some form of shirk. That's why he says here, Al-Ikhlas Al-Munafi Lil-Shirk. Sincerity which opposes and negates the shirk. وَدَلِيلُ الْإِخْلَاسِ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى And the proof that sincerity is a condition, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَلَا لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِسِ That indeed to Allah is the sincere devotion. Indeed to Allah is the sincere devotion. Or... Is it not to Allah the sincere devotion is due? So the sincere devotion, i.e. the sincere worship, the obedience that is upon sincerity, that sincerity of worship, then it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, Allah mentioned in the Quran, that is Surah Zumar, ayah number 3 by the way, Similarly, in Surah Al-Bayyinah, ayah number 5, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَا That they have not been commanded except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon sincerity, upon tawheed. They have not been commanded more than this, that they should worship Allah alone, Offering the sincere devotion of worship to Him upon Tawheed. Hunafa means to be upon Tawheed. Hunafa. So the servants have not been commanded more than this, which is that we are to worship Allah alone, pure devotion to Allah alone, sincerity of worship to Allah alone upon Tawheed. So these are two examples from the ayat of the Qur'an which indicate the need for sincerity in worship. The need and the condition for sincerity as a part of the conditions of the shahada of the tawheed. Then there are some narrations from the sunnah also. There is the hadith of Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أصعد الناس بشفاعة من قال لا إله إلا الله خالصا من قلبه أو نفسه 
that the happiest people with my intercession, the happiest of the people with my intercession will be the one or those who say, La ilaha illallah, there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah, khalisan min qalbihi, sincerely from his heart, O nafsihi, sincerely from himself. So these evidences so far, they indicate to you this condition of sincerity. And this particular hadith, it is narrated by Abu Huraira once again, radiallahu anhu. And that reminds us of the homework from last week, which was to determine what is the name of Abu Huraira. So firstly, put your hands up if you tried. Put your hands up if you tried. Doesn't have to be that you got the answer, but you tried. So most people, mashallah, so now put your hands up if you got the answer. Where's the other hands disappeared now? So now only some people found the answer, but you tried, alhamdulillah. So from the brothers who found the answer, what was the name of Abu Huraira? Or what is the strongest opinion mentioned by the scholars regarding the name of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu? Abdurrahman ibn Sakhar al dawsi That's what they mention. Even though there are many statements regarding the name of Abu Huraira, there are many different statements that have been mentioned regarding the name of Abu Huraira. But from amongst the uh, most established of those opinions is that it is Abdurrahman ibn Sakhar al dawsi radiallahu anhu. How many narrations did he narrate then? Five three seven five. Five three seven four. Any other offers? Between six thousand to eight thousand. Where did you get that information from? A friend of yours. Is he fiqh? Anything else? Five three seven four is what is typically mentioned by the scholars. Five three seven four. Five thousand three hundred and seventy four. The seventy five, where did you find it? Five three seven four is what is mentioned regarding the number of narrations from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And there were other companions too who narrated into the thousands. There were some other companions too who narrated into the thousands with regards to hadith. But Abu Huraira was the most of them. So these narrations now then, and there are some others to come, but to begin with the ones that we have so far. Firstly, now we're talking about this condition of al ikhlas, the condition of sincerity. Linguistically, what does the word al-ikhlas mean? In order to talk about this condition of ikhlas, then we need to know what that actually means linguistically and in terms of the sharia. So linguistically, what does the word ikhlas mean in the Arabic language? It is mentioned al-ikhlas huwa fil at-tasfiyah. That it is linguistically purification. To purify something, to make something uh, pure. Ikhlas is tasfiyah. And that is the purification of something. Islamically, when we talk about ikhlas, then we mean by that, وَفِي الشَّرْعِ تَخْلِيصُ الْعِبَادَةِ وَتَصْفِيَتُهَا مِنْ شَائِبَةِ الشِّرْكِ وَالْرِيَاهِ To purify the worship, to make it clear and distinct and pure from any form of shirk or showing off or any of those types of affairs that could possibly mix into it to corrupt it. So you purify all of those corrupting factors away from it. That is sincerity. That you make your worship sincere, you purify it and you cleanse it and you strip it of any type of shirk or showing off 
or any of those types of affairs that could uh, make some blotch upon that. Like you have water and you have bits of dust in the water or some other affairs in the water and you take them out with a sieve, take those particles out with a sieve and you're left with the pure water. This is the meaning of it, that you purify that worship, remove these bits and these particles and these other affairs within it of shirk and riya, that you are then at the end left with that pure worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what we mean by sincerity of worship. And we know that sincerity in worship, it is one of the conditions for worship to be accepted. The scholars have mentioned that there are two pillars to every act of worship that you do. Every act of worship that you do, there are two pillars for that worship to be accepted. One of those is sincerity, al-ikhlas, and the other one is al-mutaba'ah, or al-ittiba'ah, following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Both of those conditions are required for any act of worship to be acceptable. Sincerity and following the sunnah. If one of those two pillars is missing, then that act of worship has not been performed in the correct and proper manner. And it is not acceptable. So for example, if a person does an act of worship, he does some obedience to Allah sincerely for the sake of Allah, but he misses the second pillar, which is uh, following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, he misses that pillar, but he has the pillar of doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah. This act of worship of his is not correct now, even though he says he is doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah, he has missed the second pillar which is required for any act of worship to be accepted, and that is that he needs to be following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ also. So if he only has the sincerity and he misses out the sunnah, then his act of worship is incorrect. It will end up becoming a bid'ah. It will end up becoming some type of innovation. An example, somebody walks into the masjid and he says, that today I have some free time. I am going to pray seven or eight raka'at for the Isha prayer. Somebody says one day, I have spare time today to increase my worship to Allah, to increase my obedience to Allah. I've got spare time. I'll pray eight raka'at for Isha prayer today. Increase my worship to Allah, sincerely for the sake of Allah. His act, will it be acceptable or not? Unacceptable, even though he says, I'm doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah, with ikhlas. I got time, I'm going to increase my worship. I'll pray eight raka'at for Isha. It will not be acceptable, even if he claims sincerity, because the sunnah does not tell you to pray eight for Isha, the sunnah tells you to pray four. So now he has not followed that second pillar. He is not following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, even if he claims sincerity. And that is why the Sahaba, some of them they mentioned, كَمْ مِنْ مُرِيدٍ لِلْخَيْرِ لَمْ يُصِبْهُ That there are so many people, how many people out there, they say they intend goodness, but they never get to that goodness. They say we intend sincerity in what we're doing, but they never get the good outcome or the good result. Why? Because even though they claim to be upon that sincerity, they are not following the sunnah in what they are doing. So their actions end up innovation and bid'ah. How many of the people do you hear them when they celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ as they claim? They say we're doing it sincerely to show our love for Allah and His Messenger. Even if they claim that, the second pillar is missing which is the sunnah. That celebration is not in the sunnah. Therefore it becomes an innovation. مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ Whomsoever innovates into our affair, our religion, something which is not from it, then it will be rejected. فَهُوَ رَدْ أَيْ مَرْدُودٌ عَلَى صَاحِبِهِ That it will be thrown back upon to that person and it will not be accepted. The same for the other way. 
if somebody does something following the sunnah 100%, he does a particular act of worship and he follows the sunnah 100% in how he does it. But he is not being sincere. Then this action again will be unacceptable. And the example the scholars they mention is two people they walk into the masjid. This is an example mentioned by the olden scholars Ibn Qayyim and others. That two people they walk into the masjid. And they pray side by side next to each other. When you look at them, you see them walk in, they stand next to each other and they begin to pray. And when you are observing them, you see them pray, they both pray perfect. In accordance to the sunnah, perfectly. You're watching them, how they're doing everything. It's exactly what the narrations and the hadith and the sunnah says. Exactly how you're supposed to pray, both of them. But then the scholars, they said, one of the two, it's as if he is up in the heavens, and the other one, it's as if he's in the pits of the earth. Why? If they both have followed the sunnah perfectly in how they have prayed, then why is one of them successful and one of them a failure? One was doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah, the other one, even though he prayed perfectly in accordance to the sunnah, he was only doing it to show off in front of the people who were watching him. So now he missed the sincerity, even though he followed the sunnah perfectly. So you see, if somebody misses one of those two pillars, then the act is not correct. The worship is not acceptable. Do it with sincerity, but don't follow the sunnah, your worship goes wrong. Follow the sunnah, but don't do it with sincerity and your worship goes wrong. So it requires both of those pillars for any act of worship to be acceptable. The sincerity, al-ikhlas, and following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Both of those conditions are mentioned in one ayah together in the Qur'an. The last ayah of Surah Al-Kahf is what? فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا i.e. the actions which are upon the sunnah وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا and do not commit any shirk alongside Allah i.e. be upon sincerity whomsoever wishes to meet his Lord then let him do the righteous actions righteous actions are what? the salaf they said they are the actions that are done in accordance to the sunnah and do not commit any shirk with his Lord, i.e. be upon sincerity. So in that ayah, both of these conditions are mentioned. The conditions of worship. That every worship must be upon sincerity, and it must be upon following the sunnah. And if you understand that, it will wipe out so many of the doubts the people they bring to you. So many of these different doubts the people they bring to you, they say, what's your problem with the birthday of the Prophet Wasallam? We're doing it to show our love for Allah and His Messenger. You people don't love Allah and His Messenger. You say to them, the very conditions of worship, as Allah mentions them in that ayah in Surah Al-Kaf, you have failed to fulfill them in this act of yours. Even if you claim to be sincere, where is the sunnah? Where is the second pillar of following the sunnah and what you do? So many of these acts when the people they tell you on this particular night, you have to stay up and you have to read this many raka'at and read this dua 1000 times and do this and do that. And they say sincerely do this with your heart and you will be forgiven and this will happen and that will happen. They say to them, okay, I'll do it sincerely. But the second pillar of following the sunnah, all of this what you're telling me, where is the authentic narration? Where is the sunnah telling us that on this particular night you need to pray this many raka'at and you need to read this dua this many particular times and whatever else they say. So if you were to practice this and to show this, it would remove so many of these doubts that people they bring when they say you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. Say it to them very simply, okay? Sincerely, of course. And secondly, now show me then, where is the second pillar in this act you're telling me we're supposed to do? Where is the sunnah? Where is the hadith, the ayah, the narration, the proof that this is indeed a legitimate act of worship within the sunnah? or within the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because as you know, when it comes to worship, you can only worship Allah in the manner which we've been told to worship Allah. And that is a principle we've mentioned before in previous classes. 
when it comes to worldly things, when it comes to your casual worldly affairs, then you can do what you want as you please. Unless there's an evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah telling you, you can't do something. Otherwise it's open. With religious affairs, it's the opposite. Everything is closed unless an evidence tells you something is open. So bear that in mind, the two ways that it works. With worldly affairs, it's open. Unless the Quran and the Sunnah tells you something is closed, that's haram and that's haram. In religious affairs, to start with, everything is closed. The only thing you're allowed to do is the ones which are opened by the Quran and the Sunnah for you. So with worldly affairs, you want to buy a car, shall you buy a black car or a white car or a silver car or a blue car? It's up to you. It's open. Do as you please. Buy whichever color you want. For the sake of the example, so you understand, if there was an evidence saying you're not allowed to buy blue cars, then we would say buy whatever you want, but you can't get a blue one because there's a proof. Otherwise, with worldly affairs, the principle is it's open. Buy blue, buy white, buy yellow, whichever color you want. But with religious affairs, the opposite. It's all closed unless the evidence tells you something is open. So when people, they come to you and they say, why can't we celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ? Why can't we show me a proof why we can't celebrate that? You should say what to them? It's the opposite. You should say to them, your question is wrong. It's the opposite. Now this is an act of worship. It's a religious affair. So you show me what the proof is that you can do it. Not that I have to show you why you can't do it. Because the origin, the default is, everything is closed unless there's an evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah that you do this or you do that. So now if you're going to claim this is an act of worship, you show me the proof that it's allowed. That way... You take the burden upon them. And this is a deception that many people are fooled by. They will come and they will say to you, what's the proof you can't do this? And you can't find anything. You can't find any legit, like a hadith or an ayah specifically talking about that issue. You can't find anything so you get stuck. But the reality is you should turn it upon them. Tell them this is an act of worship. For you to be performing this as an act of worship, gaining closeness to Allah via it, then you show me the proof that this is an act of worship, that you gain closeness to Allah via. So that is important to remember. So coming back to this issue now of sincerity then. Sincerity is the condition that is mentioned here for the shahada. In this first ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِسِ that indeed, for Allah is the pure religion, the sincerity, the devotion. It is purely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indicating this issue of sincerity in all of your worship. Ala lillahi dinul khalis. As Zumar ayah number three. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala says, Ay fa'budillaha wahdahu la sharika la. I.e. Allah is saying here, worship Allah alone without any partners. وَدْعُ الْخَلْقَ إِلَى ذَلِكَ And call the people to that. I.e. to the worship of Allah purely, sincerely. وَأَعْلِمْهُمْ أَنَّهُ لَا تَصْلُحُ الْعِبَادَةِ إِلَّا لَهُ وَحْدَةِ And teach the people, explain to them, make them aware. That worship cannot be upright, it does not uh, work, it is not correct for anyone else besides him alone. وَأَنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ And that he, Allah, does not have any partner. وَلَا adil, No any equal. وَلَا nadid, No any partner once again, some partner or participant. وَلِهَذَا قَالَ تَعَالَى and that's why Allah said in the Quran, Ala lillahi dinul khalis. That indeed, no doubt, surely the religion is purely and sincerely sincerity to Allah alone. No other partner, no other individual besides Allah deserves any of that worship whatsoever. A la yakbalu min al amali illa ma ukhlisa fihi al illa ma akhlasa fihi al amilu lillahi wahda la sharika la. 
Ibn Kathir finishes off by saying, meaning that Allah will not accept any obedience from you unless the person does it sincerely for his sake without any partners associated whatsoever. There are many other examples that scholars have given to highlight this point. They've given other examples for example, when people redirect their worship to others, often the people, they go to the graves of the deceased people. They say these were great awliya of Allah. They were great people when they were alive, great imams. We are such sinners. How can we make dua and Allah will accept our dua? We are so, uh, uh, such sinners. We have so much sin. So we need to go to these great pious people and ask them to make intercession on our behalf, to take our dua on our behalf to Allah. That's what they say. To this day, this is the belief of some of the people. That we are such sinners, how can we make dua to Allah and it will be accepted? We need to go to these pious people, this great imam who used to be alive recently, he's died, we'll go to his grave and we'll make the dua asking him to take our dua to Allah. These types of things that people they do. So who do they go to? They go to people who they claim were great imams, awliya of Allah. In the past, they used to go and make dua to angels, asking the angels bring us closer to Allah. They would make dua to the prophets and the messengers. And that is something still to this day. When they go to the grave of the prophet ﷺ, and they make the dua to the prophet ﷺ to take the dua to Allah. They seek this type of intercession. These types of things have been explained by the scholars that when they go and make this type of seeking of intercession for their dua to be taken to Allah, they will go to these noble and righteous, like the righteous people or the angels or the prophets. In certain narrations, they explain how even the prophets and the messengers and even the angels, all of them are the creation of Allah. All of them themselves are seeking closeness to Allah. All of them themselves are seeking a means to Allah. So what therefore of other people asking them to do it on their behalf too? When they themselves are the servants of Allah seeking closeness to Allah. If you read the narrations about the revelation, when the revelation Allah speaks the revelation in the heavens, then it's mentioned how the angels, they collapse from their fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the revelation is spoken, and then the angels they say to each other, what did your Lord say? And then Jibreel alayhi salam mentions to them, he spoke the truth, and he is the most high. So the angels, the prophets, the messengers, all of them are from the creation of Allah. So it is not suitable to redirect your worship to anyone else besides Allah neither to the prophets and the messengers to ask them to take your dua to Allah, neither to the angels to ask them to take your dua to Allah. Rather, every individual, you make your dua sincerely to Allah yourself. And Allah hears everyone, hears every language, every person. It's mentioned in a hadith. لَوْ قَامَ أَوَّلَكُمْ وَآخِرَكُمْ وَإِنسَكُمْ وَجِنَّكُمْ عَلَى صَعِيدٍ وَاحِدٍ If all of you were stood upon one plane of land, from the beginning of mankind to the end, every person and every jinn, everyone was stood upon one plane of land, and you were all to make dua to Allah, and you, every single one of you, from the beginning of mankind to the end, the billions and billions and the numbers which are beyond that, every single person, if he was to make dua, it is mentioned that Allah would be able to answer the dua of all of them, and it would not decrease from His kingdom anything. So a person, he returns to Allah, he submits to Allah, he humbles himself in front of Allah. You make your dua to Allah. If you have sinned, then seek forgiveness for that sin. Do not be like these people who are conned by the shayateen, the whispers of the shayateen. They are deceived by that. When the shaitan says to them, you have committed so many sins, there is no dua for you. How is your dua going to be answered? Rather, you make the dua. What did Allah mention in the Quran? قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْلَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say it to my servants, the ones who have oppressed themselves, the ones who have sinned and erred, do not become despondent 
from the mercy of Allah. Meaning do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah. So a person, he keeps his trust in Allah and he makes his dua to Allah and he makes all of his worship sincerely and purely to Allah. None of this going to these awliya and making it to them or going to the deceased in the graves or even going to the graves of the prophets and the messengers. That is not from our religion. Then Al-Imam Ibn Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala says, هَذَا تَقْرِيرٌ لِلْأَمْرِ بِالْإِخْلَاصِ وَبِيَانْ أَنَّهُ تَعَالَى كَمَا, أن كما أَنَّهُ لَهُ الْكَمَالِ كُلُّهُ وَلَهُ التَّفَضُّلْ عَلَى عِبَادِهِ مِنْ جَمِيعِ الْوُجُوهِ فَكَذَلِكَ لَهُ الدِّينُ الْخَالِصُ الصَّافِي مِنْ جَمِيعِ الشَّوَائِبِ فَهُوَ الدِّينُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَاهُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَارْتَضَاهُ لِصَفْوَةِ خَلْقِهِ وَأَمَرَهُمْ بِهِ لِأَنَّهُ مُتَضَمِّلٌ لِلتَّأَلُّهِ لِلَّهِ فِي حُبِّهِ وَخَوْفِهِ وَرَجَائِهِ وَالْإِنَابَةِ إِلَيْهِ فِي عُبُودِيَّتِهِ وَالْإِنَابَةِ إِلَيْهِ فِي تَحْصِيلِ مَطَالِبِ عِبَادِهِ Al-Imam Ibn Sa'di رحمه الله تعالى one of the great scholars who passed away recently he mentions that this is a confirmation or affirmation of the command of Allah. This is a further proof and an establishment of the command of Allah to be sincere. And the clarification to you that Allah is perfect in every affair. For Allah is the complete perfection. And for Him is the virtue over His servants, over His creation. From every angle. That Allah has the virtue over us in every angle. So similarly, from the angle of our worship to Him, we need to be upon that sincerity and purity from every type of affair that could mix into that sincerity. To strip that away and to remove any act which could have any detrimental detrimental effect upon that tawheed. And that is the religion that Allah is pleased with. And that is what He was pleased with upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is what He commanded them with. Because within that sincerity and purity to Allah is the sincerity and purity of your worship to Allah. And that is what's required. Not the split worship between Allah and others. And we're going to come to that later. When Allah mentions about the mushrikeen, how they used to love Allah, but at the same time they used to love their other deities also. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ The mushrikeen, they used to take other deities, other gods, and they used to love them just like they love Allah. So they split their worship, they split their love between Allah and their other gods. But what is required of a believer of a person of Tawheed is that he makes that pure to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this Tawheed and this sincerity, this sincerity of worship, it purifies the hearts and it rectifies the hearts of the people. وَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يُسْلِحُ الْقُلُوبُ وَيَزَكِّيهَا وَيَطَهِّرُهَا دُونَ الشِّرْكِ بِهِ فِي شَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْعِبَادَةِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِّنْهُ وَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ فِيهِ شَيْءٍ and this purity and sincerity is what rectifies the hearts and purifies the hearts and cleanses the hearts. And in fact, the scholars have mentioned, as a Shaykh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned, your sincerity in worship, it is one of the means and causes to remove difficulty. Any difficulty which overcomes you in the decree, certain difficulties may overcome you, certain situations certain circumstances that you find hard upon yourself and difficult and you are concerned about them. The removal of these difficulties, one of the factors behind that is the purity and the sincerity of the worship you do to Allah. Who can think of an example to prove that? What is the example of the hadith of the three men who were stuck in a cave and a boulder and a rock came at the front of the cave? And they couldn't move and they couldn't get out. What is that narration? So then they mentioned the sincere deeds that they did. They began to make dua to Allah 
and stating some of the sincere deeds they did. And they began to say that if I did this deed sincerely for your sake, and they mentioned those certain deeds as a consequence of that, because they were genuinely sincere deeds that they had done with ikhlas to Allah. Then the rocket moved slowly and slowly until they were able to release themselves. As Shaykh al Uthaymeen said, look at this example, it shows to you the sincerity of their actions, the dua that they made upon the sincerity of the actions that they had done. That was a cause for this, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removing that rock and allowing them to be released. So the sincerity of worship, it is something that removes the grief and the hardship and the difficulties that a person may face. Then after that was the second ayah. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَافَا تَمَامُهَا وَيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمَةَ In Surah Al-Bayyina, ayah number 5, that they were not commanded, i.e. the servants, we've not been commanded with anything other than to worship Allah sincerely alone upon purity. That is the command Allah has given us. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَافَا We've not been commanded with anything other than with anything other than to worship Allah purely and sincerely with that ikhlas of worship and obedience to Him. Again, as Shaykh Abd rahman as Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَافَا أي قاصدين بجميع عباداتهم الظاهرة والباطنة وجه الله وطلب الزلفة لديه That every worship you do, the Shaykh says in the explanation of this, you seek by that, you seek by every worship you do, open and apparent or inward, whether it's an inward type of worship or an open and apparent type of worship, Every type of worship you seek by that, the face of Allah, i.e. that you are doing it to gain the closeness to Allah. Doing it to gain the closeness to Allah, doing it sincerely to Allah. Hunafa, ay mu'radina ma'ilina an sa'ir al-adyan al-mukhalifa lidin al-tawheed. Hunafa, it means that you are disinclined, moved away from all of that which opposes the religion of Tawheed. You shun away, you turn away from all of that which opposes Tawheed, and you face towards and you are inclined upon Tawheed. That's what Hunafa means, i.e. that they are people of Tawheed. So here Allah commands us to make all of that worship purely seeking the pleasure of Allah, seeking the reward of Allah, seeking closeness to Allah, Upon Tawheed, i.e. away and free from shirk. Just like Ibrahim alayhi salam, what did he say in that ayah? وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ إِنَّنِي بَرَاءٌ مِّمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ That when he said to his father and his people, I am innocent of what you worship, freeing himself from that shirk, freeing himself from that obedience of the other idols, and making himself pure towards Tawheed. لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ لِفَضْلِهِمَا وَشَرَفِهِمَا وَكَوْنِهِمَا الْعِبَادَتَيْنِ اللَّتَيْنِ مَنْ قَامَ بِهِمَا قَامَ بِجَمِيعِ شَرَائِ الدِّينَ وَذَلِكَ أَيَّ التَّوْحِيدُ وَالْإِخْلَاصِ فِي الدِّينَ هُوَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمَةِ At the end then Allah says that the deen al-qayyimah, i.e. the upright religion, the upright and sound religion is the one who is upon the religion of pure tawheed to Allah. That is the basis of Islam. The very basis of the shahada is that tawheed, as we said in the very first condition, affirmation and negation. The affirmation of worship to Allah alone, the negation of worship from everything else besides Allah. It's about now understanding the reality of that. Understanding what these certain types of acts are that people do which negates this sincerity. Because then in reality they put their dependence and their trust in others. All of these stories that you hear which are true. When people can't have children and they can't do something else, they are told, go to such and such a great imam. Go to him and he will blow over you, wipe over you, make dua for you, you'll be able to have a child. And people believe in that type of stuff. And they go and do that type of thing. 
That is all in opposition to the very fundamentals of the religion. Only if they learnt and they had knowledge of these affairs of what their shahada really means. So here, this ayah in the Quran again is telling us about purifying our worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Then after that, from the sunnah, the hadith that we mentioned of Abu Hurairah, أَسْعَدُ النَّاسِ بِشَفَاعَةِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ خَالِصًا مِنْ قَلْبِهِ أَوْ نَفْسِهِ That the happiest of the people, the happiest of the people with my intercession are those who say La ilaha illallah, that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah, sincerely from their hearts. And that is the point of this particular narration, that they say it sincerely from their hearts. The happiest of the mankind with the intercession will be those who say La ilaha illallah sincerely from their hearts or from themselves. A Shaykh Ubaid Hafidahullah says, Qultu al hadithu fi sahih al Bukhari wa ghayri wa lafdhuhu and al Bukhari an Abi Huraira ta annahu kal the full hadith which is in al Bukhari. Qil ya Rasulullah, it was said, O Messenger of Allah. مَنْ أَسْعَدُ النَّاسِ بِشَفَاعَتِكَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Who will be the happiest of the people with your intercession on the day of judgment? Who will be the happiest of mankind with your intercession on the day of judgment? قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم, The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, said to Abu Huraira, لَقَدْ ظَنَنْتُ يَا أَبَا هُرَيْرَ أَلَّا تَسْأَلُنِي عَنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَوَّلَ مِنْكَ He said that I considered... I thought that no one would ask me about this hadith before you. The Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Hurairah, I thought, I thought nobody would ask me about this hadith before you. لِمَا رَأَيْتُ مِنْ حِرْسِكَ عَلَى الْحَدِيثِ For that which I have witnessed from you, in terms of your eagerness to learn the hadith, in terms of your eagerness for hadith. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Hurairah, I thought nobody else would ask me about this before you. Because of what I have seen from you in terms of your eagerness to learn this hadith. As'adun nas, then the Prophet ﷺ gives him the answer. As'adun nas bi shafa'ati yawm al qiyama, man qala la ilaha illallah khalisa min qalbi, aw nafsi. That the happiest of the people with my intercession will be those who say la ilaha illallah sincerely from their hearts or from themselves. Wa'alam. بأن شفاعة يقول الشيخ عبيد وعلم بأن شفاعة المذكورة في هذا الحديث هي الشفاعة في أهل الكبائر من الموحدين. This شفاعة which is being spoken about in this narration, it is the شفاعة for the people, Muslims, people of توحيد who had committed sins. عصات الموحدين. The people, the Muslims. Who had committed sins. Because we know on the day of judgment as we mentioned before. There are those who die upon shirk. In the hereafter. In the hellfire forever. Then there are the believers. The people of Tawheed. But some of them. Even though they were people of Tawheed. They may have committed other sins. Not shirk but other sins. From major sins. Perhaps other types of sins. So those people may be punished for that. But eventually they will be entered into paradise. So those people who had some sins, even though they were people of Tawheed, then this shafa'a will occur for them. It's mentioned how some of them, they are in the fire, and then the people will say, Oh Allah, they used to pray with us, they used to fast with us. And then Allah will say, Go remove from the fire those with iman in their hearts. So with that intercession they are removed. In one narration it is the Prophet ﷺ, who then removes these people from the fire also. So these types of intercession, they occur on the day of judgment, and they are proven, established types of intercession. With regards to intercession, it should be understood. Shafa'ah. As Ahlu Sunnah, what is the position we have towards intercession? Is it permissible or not? It's permissible. In that case, what is the problem you have? 
if somebody goes to a grave and seeks intercession from that person, or goes to the Prophet Sallallahu grave and seeks intercession from him, if you're going to say it's permissible, then why is it wrong for them to do that? It's not in accordance to the Sunnah. You must remember with regards to intercession. Huh? So, with intercession, the position of Ahlul Sunnah, the correct understanding, the methodology, what the Prophet ﷺ taught and what the Sahaba are upon, the shafa'a, the intercession, there are two types. One type which is affirmed, affirmed by Ahlul Sunnah that it is correct. And there is another type which is not correct. The type which is correct has certain conditions. When those conditions are in place, then that type of shafa'a intercession is okay, it's correct. When those conditions are missing, then it's not correct. What are those conditions? One is that the shafa'a, the intercession that is being done, it must be done by the permission of Allah. What is the evidence for that? The permission of Allah. Okay. Some people know the answer. That's your homework for this week. The homework for this week is to find out what is the evidence and we'll make it even easier for you. It's in Ayatul Kursi. Go and examine Ayatul Kursi. Everybody examine Ayatul Kursi and next time tell us where in Ayatul Kursi is the proof that you require the permission of Allah for the intercession to be correct. That intercession can't just be made without the permission of Allah. So examine Ayatul Kursi and everybody come and tell us where in Ayatul Kursi does it tell you or indicate to you that the permission of Allah is required for the intercession to be correct. That is the first condition. The second condition is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be pleased with the person who is making the intercession and the one who the intercession is being made for. Because remember, intercession is the combination of two people. That's what intercession is. It is the combination of two people, a shafa'a, in Arabic from a shafa'a, which means to join two together, make even. Because intercession is basically that I ask somebody to go and speak on my behalf. I can't get to the top man, but I know somebody who knows him, so I ask him to go and speak on my behalf to the top man. Intercession. So here now, the condition Allah mentions in the Quran is that the person who is making the intercession and the one who it is being made for, both of them have to be from those people that Allah is pleased with. And what does it mean that Allah is pleased with them both? That they are both people of Tawheed. They have to both be people of Tawheed. They are the conditions for the acceptable, correct intercession. And there are certain types of that which will occur on the Day of Judgment. When everybody is in the difficulty and the sun is brought close and the calamities which occur after the resurrection, then the people will say, Ama tarawna ma nahnu Can you not see what calamity we are in? Find somebody who will make intercession with Allah on our behalf. So they go to the prophets and the messengers to Adam alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam. They go to the prophets and the messengers but all of them excuse themselves until they come to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and he makes the intercession. Similarly, when the people who are going to enter paradise have gone through all of the day of resurrection, and they've come to the gates of paradise, they find that the gates of paradise are closed, as it says in the hadith, when they get to paradise, the ones who are going to enter paradise, they find that the gates of paradise are closed. So again, they go to all of the prophets and messengers asking, who can intercede on our behalf with Allah? Who can go and speak to Allah on our behalf to have the gates of paradise opened? Again, all of the prophets and messengers excuse themselves until they finally come to Muhammad wasallam. He then makes the intercession for the gates of paradise to be opened and the people to enter. So these are certain types of intercession that occur on the day of judgment and there are others too. So that is the point to remember regarding intercession. We don't deny it. We accept it. But with those conditions, when people go to the graves, those conditions are lost. 
There is no permission in the Quran, in the Sunnah, there is no permission from Allah for you to go and make dua to a dead person in the grave. Those conditions are lost in the types of things people do. Even going to the Prophet ﷺ, even going to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, and asking him to take your dua to Allah is incorrect. And there is proof from the Sahaba, a narration from them which proves you cannot go to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him to take your dua after he died. That narration is regarding on one occasion, or firstly, there was an occasion where there was a drought. There was a drought. So a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, when the Prophet ﷺ was still alive, a man came to him and he said, make dua for us, there's a drought, etc. So the Prophet ﷺ made dua and plentiful rain came. Then later, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, a similar situation occurred where there was a drought. So again, they needed to make the dua, they needed to uh, uh, make dua for the rainfall, etc. Now, in that occasion, in this second occasion, the Prophet ﷺ had died. Who did the companions go to and say to him, you make dua for the rainfall because we're in this drought? They went to Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Why did they go to Abbas? Anhu? The point here is, is it conceivable, is it conceivable in any way, shape or form, that if it was permissible to go to the Prophet ﷺ, the companions would have chosen not to do that anyway, and go to Abbas instead. What can only be the reason, what can be the only reason why the companions didn't go to the Prophet ﷺ, instead went to Abbas anhu? Because they knew that after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, you cannot go and make the dua to him to ask for the rainfall, etc., to take the dua to Allah. They knew that. That's why they didn't do that. They went to Abbas instead. Because if you're not going to say, no, it was allowed, they could have gone to the Prophet ﷺ, it was allowed. That's not an evidence that it wasn't allowed. Then you have to answer the question, why would they choose Abbas anhu over the Prophet ﷺ? Is that conceivable? It's not. It's no sense. It wouldn't make sense to choose any of the other companions over the Prophet ﷺ. The only reason they did that was because they knew that wasn't an option. It wasn't an option to go to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Hence, they went to Abbas anhu instead. So this indicates that the shafa'a of that nature is impermissible. Moving on to the next narration, the hadith of Utban ibn Malik. Hadith of Utban ibn Malik. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الله حرم على النار من قال لا إله إلا الله يبتغي بذلك وجه الله. This hadith which is in Bukhari and Muslim that Allah سبحانه وتعالى will make the fire haram to take somebody who says لا إله إلا الله sincerely from his heart. The one who says لا إله إلا الله sincerely from his heart. And there's a lengthier narration that the Shaykh mentions, but we'll stick to the Shahid for now due to time. That in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ clearly mentions, Whomsoever says, La ilaha illallah with sincerity from his heart, then the fire is haram upon him. That is the condition again being highlighted, the requirement for sincerity in the person's statement. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ حَرَّمَ عَلَيْهِ النَّارِ this again we can say what we said the last time. The narration says, Whomsoever says, La ilaha illallah, sincerely from his heart, then the fire will be made haram upon him. It will be haram for him to enter the fire. That again is on two levels. There is one level where absolutely it will be made uh, forbidden for him to enter the fire. Absolutely he will not. He will go straight to paradise. But there is the second level whereby that uh, prohibition or that impermissibility of him entering the fire is a relative term again. Meaning that he was a person of Tawheed, he said it sincerely from his heart. But if he had other sins, he may enter the fire temporarily to be uh, uh, punished and cleansed from those sins. But then after that he will be entered into paradise. Therefore, it still applies that it is impermissible for him to enter the fire upon a level of infinity or forever. 
He will not enter the fire forever, a person who dies upon La ilaha illallah sincerely. It could be that he's absolutely protected. A person who is upon Tawheed, he repents from any sins that he makes, he seeks forgiveness, he is pure upon that way, he may enter paradise directly, completely forbidden from the fire. But there could be others who died upon Tawheed, but because of their sins, they may initially enter, but they are still, the hadith still applies, that they are prohibited from the fire, i.e., they will not remain in the fire. The fire will not be able to keep them forever. They will have to exit then and enter into paradise thereafter. And that is for the Usat al Muhiddin, Tahrim al Khulud. وهذا في حق عساة الموحدين كما دلت عليه أحاديث شفاعة المتواترة في أهل الكبائر So the sinners from the people of Tawheed that is what could occur that a person of Tawheed who was a sinner may enter hellfire and be punished for those sins but then afterwards he will enter paradise Then we have this narration at the end The narration at the end which is in عمل يوم الليلة I think وللنساء في اليوم الليلة نعم وللنساء في اليوم والليلة من حديث رجلين من الصحابة عن يبس سلم قال من قال لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير مخلصا بها قلبه يصدق بها لسانه إلا فتق الله لها السماء فتكا فتقا حتى ينظر إلى قائلها من أهل الأرض وحق لعبد نظر الله إليه أن يعطيه سؤلة This narration uh, narrated by النسائي in the book uh, اليوم الليلة عمل اليوم الليلة or in this one it is mentioned نعم في كتاب عمل اليوم الليلة uh, and also أخرجه النسائي في السنن الكبرى in both of those it is mentioned. And in this hadith it mentions that a person who says La ilaha illallah, a person who says La ilaha illallah sincerely from his heart, a person who says La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, so a person who says that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah, sincerely that there is no other partners alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this individual, it is mentioned, له الملك وله الحمد, and he also states that to Allah belongs the dominion, and to him belongs all of the praise, وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all capable of every affair uh, and his tongue is in accordance to that his tongue is in accordance to that pronouncing it truthfully from his tongue except that Allah causes the heavens to split so that he may look at the person from the people of the earth who is saying it anyone whom Allah looks at will be granted whatever he asks for so the narration mentions that whomsoever says La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, and to Allah belongs the dominion, and to Him belongs all of the praise, and He is all capable of everything. Mukhlisan biha, sincerely from His heart, and His tongue pronounces that upon the truthfulness of that too. Then Allah will split the skies to look at this person who is saying that, and whomsoever Allah does that for, then the person, whatever He asks for, then it will not be rejected. This particular narration, the scholars do say that there may be some speech regarding the authenticity of it. There is some speech regarding the authenticity of this narration. As Shaykh Ubaidi says, Qultu wa fi isnadihi Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Maymun wa Ya'qub ibn Asim ibn Arwa ibn Mas'ud qala al-hafiz في كل منهما مقبول والمعروف في من هذا حاله في اصطلاحه أنه لين الحديث إذا لم يتابع فالحديث على هذا ضعيف ولم أجد له من الشواهد والمتابعات ما, يقو ما يقويه والله أعلم The Sheikh says that this narration basically due to certain narrators in it is weak 
This particular narration mentioned in that way is weak. However, the meaning of it from the initial section is no doubt correct. That whomsoever says that sincerely from his heart, that is one of the conditions of La ilaha illallah. Even though the actual wording of that narration in that way, it appears to be weak as the shaykh he mentions. So that is basically the narrations that highlight the condition of having this sincerity of worship to Allah. And there is more that can be mentioned regarding the sincerity of worship to Allah. One of the greatest books that you can examine is Kitab Tawheed, the book of Tawheed. By a Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala. That book it goes through chapter upon chapter of all types of worship in sincerity to Allah. And the types of worship that would negate and nullify your sincerity to Allah. Clarifies and explains all of those one by one. But here for our purposes will suffice with those evidences that are mentioned. Those ayat and those couple of ahadith. We will suffice with that and we'll conclude with the statement of Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He said, Hasiluhu an la ila an la ilaha illallah sababun liduhul il jannah wan najah min an nah. The conclusion Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah says upon this issue of sincerity in your worship, sincerity as a condition of the shahada, that la ilaha illallah is a cause. One of the reasonings for your entering into paradise and from your salvation from the fire. And it is necessitating that. The shahada necessitates your salvation from the fire and your entering into paradise. Lakin al muqtada la yu'malu amaluhu illa bistijma'i shuruti wa antifa'i mawani'i. However, he says. Even though la ilaha illallah necessitates that the one who is upon that sincerely with these conditions we've mentioned will enter paradise. Something which is necessitated by something else only occurs if the conditions are in place. The shahada necessitates that a person will enter into paradise. But only if the person has those conditions in place with his shahada. And that is that famous narration of Wahab ibn Munabbih. Wahab ibn Munabbih, when he mentioned, when it was said to him, Alaysa la ilaha illallah miftah al jannah, is la ilaha illallah not the key to paradise? Qala bala, he said, of course. But then he said, Walaysa, ulakin laysa min, al, uh, min miftah illa walahu asnan. There is no key except that it has grooves, it has the grooves on the key. The, the teeth, the carvings. Otherwise, if it's just a blunt piece of metal, you can't open the door. It needs to have those cuts. Those cuts, those grooves in the key that fit into the lock and open it. So he said, of course, La ilaha illallah is the key to paradise. However, however, that key to paradise is only the key to enter you in there if you bring that key with the correct grooves, i.e. with the conditions and the prohibitions, the prohibiting factors are out and absent, i.e. shirk and those affairs. So this is what we are discussing and this is the purpose of our studies here now, that we understand what that shahada is with the actual grooves, with the conditions. So that is La ilaha illallah with the condition of sincerity. Uh, next time, inshallah ta'ala, next week, we'll continue with the fourth condition, which is the condition of truthfulness being truthful in your testification that sidq that truthfulness that is what we will discuss because the opposite of truthfulness is nifaq is having nifaq in your heart hypocrisy so how does a person maintain himself upon the shahada in opposition and refuting and rebuking and removing any type of nifaq from himself any type of hypocrisy. That will continue with next week, inshallah, after the Isha prayer. And we'll conclude upon that point today. Before we go, we should remind you as well that this Thursday and Friday, 25th and 26th of December, there is a conference in Birmingham, in Small Heath. 
a conference in Birmingham in Small Heath at the Salafi Masjid uh, on the two days of 25th and 26th, Thursday and Friday coming. A two-day event, there will be several speakers, there will be several topics and lectures, there will be some telelinks with some of the scholars. Uh, so that is a two-day event for the whole family. Brothers, sisters, there is space and location for everybody. There will be marquees and all types of other things, books, etc. So it's a two-day event that everybody should try to attend. Take your families and everyone, your friends, etc. And it will be a good experience and there will be good knowledge to be sought and to be taken from that two-day event from the lectures, inshallah ta'ala. So everybody should make the effort for that Thursday and Friday, 25th and 26th. And we'll uh, carry on next Saturday again at the normal time, inshallah.